So no doubt many of you have heard about the ICOM SHF project that has been happening. It was showed off at the Dayton uh, Hamvention uh, a couple of weekends ago. In fact, here's some footage which was taken from that weekend. I'd like to thank Josh from Ham Radio Crush Course for using this footage. Uh, it was shown off at the ICOM stand for the first time. Uh, this is a ICOM Japan have come up with this prototype or this project for the SHF uh, bands. But uh, today I wanted to sort of sh explain a little bit about about what I think about this um, project and some of the things that ICOM probably should work on while it's in the prototype stage before it gets to market because there's a couple of things about it that seem a little bit, well, well they're, they're a little bit confusing to me. So a little bit of background about what this actually is. So uh, ICOM have developed a theme called the ICOM SHF project, which is the super high frequency band challenge they're calling it so what they're wanting to do is develop new amateur radio use in the 2.4 and 5.6 gigahertz bands which i think is excellent because these bands are very underutilized now uh, the 1.2 gigahertz band is also another it's a uhf band but it's also in that gigahertz range that's already available in the icom ic 9700 so i can see what icom are doing here they're now jumping to the next uh, available bands and the 3.4 gigahertz band which sits between 2.4 and 5.6 um, i can see why they've jumped over that too because in the united states the 3.4 gigahertz has sort of been lost there. Uh, we've still got it here in Australia and there's a couple of other countries that still have it. But um, yeah, I can understand why they've, they've skipped over that. So for this one, it's 2.4 and 5.6 gigahertz. So what they um, said in their little blurb, and I'll put some links in the description below to uh, all of the information that they've released on this product so far. So I come say that they are working to develop a system which can operate on the SHF bands for amateurs. Now, they've come, they've identified two main areas which are a problem and that's large cable loss because the higher in frequency you go, the more cable loss you have. And also a product that has a high frequency stability requirement because the higher in frequency you go, the more difficult it is to uh, make sure that it's on frequency and it stays on frequency. So this is the second volume that they released on this project. They talk about here some interesting bits of testing that they did on this SHF uh, product. So they calculated here some cable loss. So for instance here that if there is a 30 meter long, 15 millimeter diameter high quality coaxial cable, if that's used between the antenna and the transceiver, the cable loss will be 7.2 dB and a two watt output from a transceiver will be reduced to 380 milliwatts output from the antenna. So I'm assuming this 15 millimeter diameter, that's slightly bigger I think than RG213. So I'm not quite sure what cable they're talking about there. Heliax or Andrews LDF450 cable, which is you know kind of the most common sort of cable that you use up at these frequencies. Um, so, but yeah, rightly so, um, the higher in frequency, the more difficult it is to avoid that cable loss. So um, they talk about here also the second challenge, which is that frequency stability that we talked about. IC9700 has this frequency stability of plus or minus 0.5 parts per million. Uh, at the 5.6 gigahertz band, it means 2800 hertz deviation, which is way too much. So that would be outside the SSB and CW um, portions of the IF filter. So you won't be able to actually hear the signal to be moving around too much. That's why they've come up with uh, these uh, solutions, which is they have mounted the RF module up the tower. They've mounted uh, it uh, high up away and then they've run a LAN cable basically back and into what they're calling a controller and we'll have a look at what that is a little bit later on. So they've eliminated that issue by running uh, every all the data over a LAN cable and all of the RF is up the tower and you have a very, very short run of coaxial cable, which is great. Um, it's done commercially you see that they do that now with wireless internet links which are also on the same sort of frequencies it's all um, cat 5 cat 6 cable up the tower and uh, the rf modules up there so that's uh, that's nothing really new the other thing they said about using a land cable too is, is that you can power it over ethernet which again is something that's been done for quite a long time uh, now frequency stability so this is an interesting one uh, many of you who have watched some of my videos on the IC9700, uh, we made some videos about how that was not um, stable enough using the uh, included 10 megahertz input 
into the radio. So the, the radio had a 10 megahertz frequency reference input, which when before the radio was released, we all thought was just um, you feed 10 megahertz in and your radio is locked to that reference. But it wasn't really that. It was a calibration input. So uh, what they've done here is they've done something similar. They're going to be using a one pulse per second clock signal, which comes from a GPS um, satellite. And they're going to use that to then clock a frequency reference, the OCXO that they use or the oven control crystal oscillator that they use in the RF module is going to be synchronized to that one pulse per second. I was kind of interested why they decided to do this. I'm, I'm assuming that it's because they it's probably cheaper uh, because you have to, if you're going to do a whole new frequency reference, you're going to have to, you know, have new circuitry and stuff. So I think a lot of this stuff has probably been reused from other, um, part, you know, other projects. So, and it's actually quite, a, when you have a look at the controller that they used, they actually have reused some other projects as well. So they're using a one pulse per second. I kind of wondered why they've done that. It's probably, for me, it would be better if you had in addition or in replacement actually because it would be better than one pulse per second would be just a frequency reference um, which if you have an OCXO in the in the um, RF module it will just um, synchronize to that. One of the things that would probably be a little bit difficult with that though is the fact that it is up the pole you'd have to run another coaxial cable up the pole with your frequency reference from your GPS receiver in your shack up to it. So I guess that's one good thing about having the GPS one pulse per second stuff that they've got inbuilt in. It does save you having to do that. Um, but, you know, it's just uh, it's just interesting what they did there. So that's, that's the second volume. So the third one that they released, and this was uh, before the release here at Dayton, which they showed, so this is what the controller looks like. And straight away, you notice that it looks like an IC705. Originally, I thought it actually was an IC705 and that they'd updated some firmware and that you used your existing IC705 to drive the RF module kind of like a transverter. But it doesn't actually work that way. This is a completely different controller with an IC705 almost identical front panel, same too with the LCD, but it's got different guts in it. It doesn't have any RF guts in it. It looks like it's got uh, just a simple LAN cable coming out of the radio plus power. And in actual fact, looking at the weekend, it looks pretty much that's all it really is, is just a LAN cable and power coming out of the controller. Yeah, this, uh, I guess they've just reused the same housing and they've just put some different electronics in it. Um, so interesting that they went down that route. Again, I thought that it would have been interesting to maybe they could have done like a little uh, board or a little maybe a little box transverter sort of converter box to LAN and then you could have, you know, driven it using your 705 um, or any other radio for that matter. But yeah, you're kind of limited to this controller which, you know, might be a good or bad thing. Uh, then we move down to this is the RF module. So this has two connectors on the top. You've got a 5.6 gigahertz antenna there and a 2.4 gigahertz antenna there. And you've got the GPS antenna and here's the LAN cable going up and into the device itself. One thing that I'm kind of wondering about this is the application for it because I haven't read, I don't think I've come across anywhere where it has specific specifications on the output power of this. I know that in the previous volumes they were speaking about you know the theoretical bits about if we used a two watt transceiver this is how much power we'd get out after a you know coax loss that's probably the only power information that i've heard from them so i guess two watts has probably sounds about right what they're going to have with this now two watts on these frequencies it will get you a relatively far distance uh, point to point uh, but you're probably only going to be able to talk around town. I've got some transverters which they run, uh, they've got amplifiers and they'll run up to 60 watts on 2.4 gigahertz, which uh, is a lot more power and it, and it gets you out a lot better. I've also got a preamp in those systems, but it doesn't look like on this particular unit you can interface an amplifier or a preamplifier to 
you know, make it receive a little bit better. So I'm just thinking an application would be like Earth, Moon, Earth. If you wanted to use this for EME on these bands, you definitely need a higher output power from a PA to run from this unit. And it doesn't look like you'll be able to interface that in any way. I mean, I can't really see in this photo and in the video of the prototype any outputs or control outputs to switch relays and switch um, amplifiers and stuff like that. So yeah, it just looks like you just whack an antenna on here and, and it's going to work. So I guess that limits the operation of it because it's kind of one of those things where you'll only be able to maybe just, you know, use it to talk across town or send some, you know, data or something like that. I'm, I'm not quite sure. For me, the applications that I use in microwave is for experimentation, antenna experimentation. But then I've also done some long distance stuff and I wouldn't have been able to do that with two watts. Uh, looking at the last volume here, so this is basically just showing it off here at uh, at Ohio and you can see that the, the displays and it had it under glass. One of the things that I thought was interesting about this too was that the whole this, the whole showing off of this particular unit was under glass and there wasn't like a paired unit so that you could have one maybe on one side of the booth and the other one on the other side and that you'd be able to talk between the two, maybe send some, some data, you know, it's sort of like show it in action it kind of was just like, hey, this is coming and we don't really know what it does, but we trust ICOM Japan's going to, you know, give us more details. And I mean, I don't I don't really blame ICOM America because they've sort of just received this and been told to show it off. So I think um, just to sort of summarize for ICOM Japan that it's definitely a good thing that you release this prototype out to people to have a look at and to sort of gauge the interest because I think it's really good to have that interest in the microwave bands because we do sort of neglect them. They're, they're a very good resource and very good experimentation bands to use. Um, and, and I applaud you for, you know, making such a product like this. I just think that the only thing that worries me is that if you don't, you know, just... <sighs> Yeah, it's just those things I think that I'd outline. There's probably other ones as well. Let me know what you actually think in the comments below, what you think when you saw this for the first time or you saw the announcement if you, if you intend to use it or you know the what you could use it for. I just thought it was just, yeah, uh, I think that ICOM Japan, the one thing that you could do is just maybe listen to amateurs with their suggestions and then see if you can make those tweaks, especially as it's in the prototype stage. It would definitely be a great thing to um you know just to improve those little things before it you know gets made in production and gets sent out to markets so one of the applications that i mentioned myself i use 2.4 gigahertz for the long distance stuff for breaking records for having some fun with experimenting with antennas bouncing signals off mountains off trees off buildings all sorts of things because of the small wavelengths involved rain scatter stuff like that which is quite interesting so if you want to find out more about the experiments that i've done on 2.4 gigahertz then there is a video over here which shows you uh, the contact that i had with ZL New Zealand which is over 2,400 kilometers away from here it was quite amazing that we actually made a contact at all check that out 73 and thank you again for watching